The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Good evening. Welcome to my state of mind. I am Dan York. The vaccine is really the central focus of our recovery in 2021. And how we feel about the vaccine is, well, it can be different from one person to the next, right? Tonight, we talk to somebody who studies our relationship to vaccines. In other words, how we feel about getting that shot. So, Dr. Alex Capel from Providence College will join me for a thorough conversation about that. First, I remind you about the vaccine distribution in Rhode Island at press time when we recorded this program just before Christmas. Here was the latest. After nine months, Rhode Island will be stepping into a new phase of COVID-19. Today is the moment we've all been looking for. Over the last nine months plus, we've connected uh, together in a shared struggle and shared grief. The first dose of Pfizer's vaccine are headed to one of the most vulnerable populations, nursing and assisted living facilities. A step health officials say will be key in getting back to normal. Everybody in this country wants to return to normal life. The fastest way for us to do that is for everybody to get vaccinated. Monday, CVS Health says it expects to begin the process of immunizing up to 4 million residents and staff. Rhode Island will represent 34,000 patients from 210 congregate shelters. I feel fine. I feel good. The shot was no problem. It'll be a while before the vaccine is available to everyone. But Dr. Troy Brennan of CVS Health says it may be available quicker than we think. And sooner or later, we're going to start flowing out lots of vaccinations and, um, you know, we're going to get to everybody. I think everybody in the country is going to be sort of eligible by the time we get to sort of late April, early May. CVS says they expect this process to be wrapped up in about 12 weeks, but they will be making three visits to each facility to ensure residents and staff are properly vaccinated. I think people were thinking that this was going to be a phenomenon that ran through 21, 22, and 23 potentially because they weren't anticipating the rapid availability of these vaccines. These vaccines and their effectiveness has been a game changer. The majority of residents are expected to be fully vaccinated three to four weeks after the initial visit. And so we have a fascinating conversation regarding this whole vaccine distribution. I mean, key in all of this is whether people take it, right? And the old thing is whether, you know, the, the vaccine is only as good as the shots in the arm. So Dr. Alexandria, Alex uh, Capel, is my guest. And I'm fascinated. She's a psychologist by trade, a professor of psychology. And her study, in large part, is why people don't take vaccines. Talk about timeliness. Uh, Dr. Capel, thank you for joining me. Great to have you. Oh, thank you for having me, Dan. Before we even get into the nitty gritties, and there's so much to it, uh, how in heaven's name does someone end up studying whether people take vaccines or not? <laughs> uh, so that's always a very interesting story. So I was a grad student at the University of Michigan, and I remember, you know, I've always had a fascination with why people believe the things that they do and the malleability of attitudes and beliefs. So how they change and fluctuate over time. And I remember, you know, just speaking with my advisor at the time, Dr. Preeti Shaw, and we were just talking about the uh, increase, I believe at the time it was measles in the U.S. and the number of cases that we were seeing. And it just kind of spiraled into this discussion of, huh, well, why aren't people vaccinating? And they're not vaccinating, especially for MMR, which is uh, particularly what I studied, so the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. And a lot of individuals there, they weren't vaccinating because of the fear of autism, which science has debunked time and time again. There's no link, there's no cause between the MMR vaccine and autism. Yet this piece of misinformation still was prevalent. So we wanted to explore, well, why is it still prevalent? And also, how can we alter those individual attitudes? So a lot of it was um, uh, started based on what we were seeing in the U.S. at the time. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's, that's fascinating. The, you know, I, I'm, I'm reminded during this COVID season with all the conversations we've had on the radio, mostly where people talk about their their you know, expectations for the, for the vaccine and their worries about it, that this is not the first time we've gone through a, you know, a confidence problem 
uh, with vaccines. In general, historically, how many episodes of vaccination have we found to be eventually problematic? Yeah, so this kind of taps into the notion of vaccine hesitancy, which is the term that uh, we'll assign to anyone who is uh, somewhat skeptical to receive a vaccine. Now, this could be a minor, you know, well, I just want to know more skepticism, or it could be I completely don't want to take this vaccine for a number of reasons. I want to dig into that, but my, my question is, have we screwed this up in the past? Have you, have you been able to research and study, you know, a vaccine that went wrong, a vaccine that uh, was not productive, a vaccine that uh, hurt people, um, anything in that category that legitimizes foundationally or historically the worry about vaccines? Um, so in my research, I haven't found anything uh, related to, you know, vaccines going wrong, so to speak, as early as the late 1800s with the emergence of the smallpox vaccine. What we see in history, for U.S. history, is that the mandates of these vaccines for smallpox, when they started to roll out, you had a small uh, but very vocal opposition, which essentially said this is a violation of our liberties, this is a violation of our freedom. And what they ended up doing was starting something called the Anti-Vaccination Society of America. And this whole idea of um, vaccination opposition, this has happened in the 1800s. We have probably seen recently uh, the MMR vaccine and hesitancy towards uh, vaccinating children for measles, mumps, and rubella. And a lot of this comes from um, essentially scientific questions that individuals may have. So a lot of times it's, well, what are we putting into our bodies? How does this work to combat or prevent uh, these vaccine preventable diseases? And a lot of times what you see is that sometimes that fear about the safety and the efficacy is kind of what can promote the opposition. Oh yeah, without a doubt, that, that, that makes, makes perfect sense. I just, uh, I, I just wonder whether there's, yeah, seemingly you haven't found it, that any kind of track will gotcha where, where people say, hey, listen, remember what happened with this vaccine and all those people got sick or that vaccine, all those people, uh, you know, had problems or, or that vaccine and guess what? It didn't work, da 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 blah, blah. Um, they, 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 yeah, I, I, I spoke to a, a young person recently who said, you know what? I, I don't want to take that vaccine. Uh, I'm, well, you know, when I was younger, uh, they made me take that HPV vaccine. And now I find out that there's some cancer uh, potential side effects. Well, they didn't tell us that when I took it. And so, I, you know, I don't want to find out three years from now that there's there's some potential side effects to this whole thing. And you know, I, I think that's a natural worry for people. You know, science is always changing. Good science, it, it, it updates, it changes. The more that we know about something, the more likely we are to update and to change that information accordingly. And with something like vaccines, and especially with uh, uh, how quickly the COVID-19 vaccine has been promoted, a lot of individuals, just like you're reporting, they're saying, well, I don't want to take that. I want other individuals to take it first. I want to know more about you know, what happens after we have taken these vaccines. What about, you know, a year from now, two years from now? And so a lot of what you're seeing regarding that hesitancy is essentially a fear of the unknown. Uh, a lot of individuals want to know about the long-term impacts. They want to know about the safety, the efficacy. Some individuals may have concerns about the potential government involvement in the production of these vaccines. And all of that plays into this hesitancy that we've been seeing. Do you find it legitimate when people talk about, uh, you know, finding about side effects uh, down the line of, of a vaccine that they were urged to take as perhaps a younger person? Uh, do we have anything that you can lean on and say, yeah, well, you know, truth be told, you know, that was legit, that concern. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and it differs, right? Uh, because one of the things we have to talk about when we talk about widespread vaccine administration, the majority of individuals will be fine. You know, that's what we see with, you know, um, any sort of widespread kind of uh, medicinal uh, treatment is that majority of individuals will be fine, but there are always going to be a small number which will have, you know, adverse 
side effects or reactions for whatever reason. Um, and that kind of goes more so into the you know, pharmaceutical side of it. Um, but that does also lead into that vaccine hesitancy we're seeing. When we come back, we'll talk about the rollout of this vaccine, politics of this vaccine. Uh, for someone who studies it, um, I'm sure this is fertile ground for you. Uh, we'll be right back. Uh, fascinating conversation. We have a psychologist who studies how we feel about taking vaccines. Uh, back with Dr. Alex Cable from PC in just a moment. Back to my state of mind, Dr. Alex Capel from Providence College is here. She's been in Rhode Island now for a year, but she's been studying this vaccine relationship to the world and to the society and to people. Um, and, and I mean, uh, look, nobody wants COVID. Nobody wanted to see this, but for somebody who's been kind of digging into this relationship between patients and needles, this is fertile ground for you. Uh, there's no joy in COVID-19, but for somebody who studies this, I mean, you're you're like a you're like a kid in the candy store, right? With this this particular for this particular conversation, have you been surprised? about anything other than just the speed of the vaccine emergence here? I believe the quickest one, uh, the quickest vaccine that we saw was for months, uh, which took, I believe, you know, several years before it was widespread rolled out and administered. So as far as, you know, the quickness, that is a little surprising, but we also have to remember COVID is unprecedented. And this unprecedented impact that it's had globally um, has been met with, uh, you know, an unprecedented push in science and a very quick push. We've had a number of researchers, you know, domestically, internationally, who have been looking at how can we fight COVID? Because just like you said, no one wants this. And so when we talk about vaccine hesitancy, one of the things we have to consider are the risk and the benefits. So here, you know, one way to kind of uh, combat that hesitancy could be to say, well, you could be at risk for getting COVID, which we know individuals who are at a higher risk for more severe COVID symptoms, but we never know how COVID will personally impact us. And so you have to kind of weigh that potential risk versus, you know, receiving a vaccine, a vaccine that um, has been uh, shown to be 95% effective um, the majority of individuals that receive it uh, have, you know, very minimal side effects, such as, you know, fever, chills, which is what you would expect to see. That signs that your body is responding appropriately to the vaccine. Um, but I would, I would argue that the speed at which these vaccines have rolled out is certainly um, unprecedented. But also, so is the pandemic that we're facing. Tell me about the the. The, the, the nature, though, of, of misinformation and, and the kind of uh, theories that abound. You talked about the MMR vaccine, and you know, my, I, have a, I have a family member who works with autistic children, and I remember these conversations 10 or 15 years ago. There's a, there's a, there's a chronic belief, you know, don't get the shot because your kid could be susceptible. Um, that's been you know, more or less dismissed, but it lingers. These, I'll tell you, it's amazing, the psychology of a lingering rumor right? Talk to me. Absolutely. So um, one of the things that we always have to discuss when talking about correcting or altering attitudes based in misinformation is, well, why is it so difficult? So um, anytime we talk about misinformation, individuals may have heard of this also referred to as fake news, alternative facts. These are different types of terms that could be used to uh, talk about the same type of uh, phenomenon, so to speak. Um, there are a few different reasons why it's hard to correct for misinformation. Uh, the first reason is something called the continued influence effect. So this occurs when we have been presented with information. That information is then later retracted or we find out that initial information was false to some degree. And then uh, what happens is that once that information has been updated, once it's been retracted, the misinformation still lingers, that initial memory still lingers, and that's a continued influence effect. So regardless of you know, whether or not it's updated, that misinformation still continues to linger in memory. Um, another thing we have to consider is 
Correcting misinformation can also result in what is known as the backfire effect. So the backfire effect is essentially when individuals strengthen their beliefs in the presence of opposing information. So as it relates to the MMR vaccine, if an individual believes that that vaccine causes autism, simply by saying, well, you know, science has shown that doesn't cause autism, here's all the facts, they may actually strengthen those original beliefs that they have. It may backfire your correcting of that information. Why? 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 Is it, is it the very idea that the, the, the very innate nature of the change of information? Uh, I've often thought about that too. Eh? You, you, you get, you know, I'm constantly reading, not at the depth of a, in a subject matter that you are, but constantly reading. And it's like, okay, now, you know, all you got to do is take a look at a, 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 say, a place like the Drudge Report, for instance. You can just go in there, and, and the latest phenomenon uh, found by you know some scientist who got a journalist and a publication to write a thing about a something that's important to us. And all of a sudden, now health-wise, right? All of a sudden, you know, you, you have to learn how to dismiss something that's not that valid. But then, when something is legitimately by, say, the CDC or uh, the FDA or some other or medical association and they come out and they say something that that changes the way we think about something you start to say well if you can change that then your situation can be changed right 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 why might the backfire effect occur in some individuals and not others it's all about how they reason so we have to talk about why are individuals motivated to reason one way or another and this kind of goes into their own individual beliefs and their individual values and we also have to discuss how individuals reason scientifically so a lot of what we see uh, you know sometimes when i uh, talk to individuals about you know my research and they'll always say well you know my my cousin or my in-law or whoever you know they believe this piece of information and it's obviously rooted in misinformation but then they say well how do you combat that um and i always am hesitant to you know say well approach it with um you know a direct opposition because of that backfire effect um and we have to be mindful uh for individuals who may have um, uh, differences in their scientific reasoning, sometimes presenting them with scientific evidence may not hold the weight that it should. Well, guess what? There's a guy that uh, sits in the White House that might uh, might that category when we come back. We'll ask, we'll, we'll ask about that. And of course, the uh, million dollar question here is, does the psychologist who study vaccines plan on getting them? We'll be right back on My State of Mind. Stay with us. Here for a final minute or two here with Dr. Alex Capel from PC. She studies the nature of how people react to vaccines. And boy, is that timely now. Uh, this president hasn't helped, has he? It's pretty simple. Not at all. Uh, I would say, and most individuals argue, he's been pretty anti-science uh, throughout much of his uh, presidency. Yeah. So, I mean, the impact, uh, have you studied the impact of leadership? This idea that so many uh, politicians now are getting shots in the arm publicly, the three former presidents are talking about getting it together. Um, does that have an impact on people? The, 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 more, the more culturally popular folks who do, will it, will it change the way people, and do you think, by the way, as we get through this, that there will be a relaxation of worry about this vaccine? Um, so to answer the first part, so having these, um, I guess, you know, high figure individuals receiving the vaccine, does it help? I think it depends on how the individuals perceive these high, you know, these high end figures. So, for example, um, you know, uh, Mike Pence recently received uh, his first dose of the vaccine, um, but for individuals who maybe don't side with you know his uh, values or his general um, uh, political sidings, they may not hold the same weight seeing him get vaccinated as individuals who do agree with him might. So it's all about how the individuals perceive who these figures are. That, that kind of I mean, listen, Dr. Fauci is more or less, you know, uh, a, a, a non-political figure, but he was politicized, so he 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 now is he's taken a lot of heat. But it does seem, though, that if we get consensus amongst leadership in this country and make this thing um, apolitical in a way, that 
perspective, right? Because everyone's got someone that they buy into. It seems to me, yeah, if they've got credibility on all this other stuff, if they put a needle in their arm, that makes me feel better. But if I didn't think that person was credible anyway, it doesn't matter to me. Is that what you're saying? More or less? Absolutely. It is all about who individuals find credible and who they find trustworthy. And that's what we see that bleeds a lot into the vaccine hesitancy. It's all about perceived trust or mistrust in it could be the healthcare system or the healthcare professionals. So if we only have a minute left here. I, I, I find it actually to be a, a kind of a personal question that, that, that when people say, you're going to get the vaccine, you're going to get the vaccine, people feel like they, they have to respond and they're uncomfortable responding. There may be all sorts of medical reasons why they decide they're not going to get the vaccine. So I'm not going to ask you that question. The, the thing is, though, um, you got to remember, you got to respect people's space and, and judging, judging people's decision to get this vaccine is, is also problematic, it seems to me, right? Uh, Absolutely. There, there are going to be certain individuals that cannot take it for a certain number of reasons. Um, you know, maybe they have autoimmune disorders and their body is physically not strong enough to, you know, handle combating um, uh, different things that are injected. So we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about who can and cannot take the vaccine. Not every individual will be able to take it. And so then it kind of, you know, the, the weight to take it falls onto the rest of the community who is able. Uh, only have a few seconds here. Are you uh, confident that, uh, that we'll get enough acceptance uh, of this? I think what we will certainly see is that over time, the more individuals that are becoming vaccinated, uh, the more that we learn about the long-term effects afterward of these vaccines, I think you will start to see some sort of uh, of a relaxation on some of that apprehension. This year? In 21? In uh, hopefully in 2021. Absolutely. It's all about how quickly we can get it rolled out. Um, Dr. Alex Capel from PC, appreciate your point of view, and we'll check in with you as this thing rolls out. Um, vaccines study of vaccines and how people take it. It's a fascinating. Final word when we come back. Stay with us. Hopefully we have more and more folks who feel better about this vaccine based on a momentum of reported success. Keep our fingers crossed for 2021 because it seems like it's our ticket out. Program reminder, our program moves to a weekly project beginning in January. You'll be able to see the show on Friday nights on Fox Providence on Saturdays at 10 p.m. on the CW channel and on Sunday night after the 11 o'clock news on WPRI 12. You have a great evening. Thanks for tuning in. Good night.